Hey there, this is Steve Lee with Veritas Catholic Network. Thank you to all of you who have made gifts of support to Veritas during this very trying time. We're bringing uplifting conversation and faithful Catholic teaching to everyone who can hear us. You can all help by going to www.veritascatholic.com. And we've got Father's Day coming up. So today, Bishop Frank will talk about fatherhood in all its forms. And after we talk about the vocation of fatherhood, he'll talk about other vocations to the priesthood and religious life and consecrated life, single life. I'd like to give a big thanks to our weekly sponsor, the Knights of Columbus Museum. Please visit the museum online at kofcmuseum.org and check out its weekly webinars. These programs are free, enjoyable, and educational. Again, it's kofcmuseum.org. Hey all, I'm Steve Lee with Veritas Catholic Network, and I am so happy to introduce, as always, His Excellency, Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, it's great to be with you always, but this week in particular, because we have some really interesting topics we're going to talk about, no? That's true, that's true. And we're going to start uh, with this upcoming Sunday is Father's Day, and this is a day that's not just for men like me who are raising children, but also for you and for our priests. Absolutely. It's fathers, it's stepfathers, it's grandfathers, it's godfathers, it's spiritual fathers, right? It's yes. a whole group of people, yeah. right? It's a lot of guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me. Yeah, exactly. Basically, it covers most of, uh, most of, uh, of the men around. Yeah. So um, let, let's start, Excellency, with, you know, you've told us a little bit about your father on previous episodes, mm -hmm. but... I'd love to hear more, and you know he was, of course, mm -hmm. uh, an instrumental part of you becoming who you are today. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. tell us more about your dad. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you recall, the word I keep using to describe my father is tough, and he was tough um, in many ways because of his background and, um, you know, growing up with a third grade education in a small village where his first job, believe it or not, was to smash boulders into smaller stones so that they could be used for building homes. Wow. Okay, right, that's something <laughs> so foreign to our Amer my experience, to American experience. That was my father. Um, so my father really had it really tough he was one of, I forget, I think there were eight, uh, well, it would have been my aunts and uncles. One died in the seminary. My father's, what would have been his oldest brother, went to the seminary, died in the seminary from what they think was a cerebral hemorrhage at 21 years old. Oh, my word. And in fact, my sister is named after him because he was Antonio. My sister's Antonia. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so my father was... Uh, so he had that background. And coming to the United States, he came at a fortunate time when immigrants were welcomed and he had the ability to do manual labor. And he built a life for us. You know, he was a long, first he was a barber. Okay. And my father readily admitted that he did not have the patience or the people skills to be a barber. That was not in his charism. <laughs> But he became a longshoreman. That was in his charism. And he was, in his prime, one of the strongest men I've ever met. I bet. And let me tell you a little story. Yes. There was one, one, there was one time. This is my father never struck my sister. And I never. Never. Ever. He didn't have to because when he gave you that dirty look, you knew your life was in mortal danger. So <laughs> you just better like straighten up and sit down. Do what you're told. Right? <laughs> Once I pressed maybe one too many buttons. I don't remember exactly what it was. And he, with one arm, literally picked me up by the shirt. Now, you may say, what's the big deal? You know what the big deal was? In my, in when I was younger, I was a hefty kid. I, I topped off at 244 pounds in high school. Wow. You don't, don't give me that look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm imagining your dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this may be radio, but I can still see your face. <laughs> 
244 pounds. That's a whole nother story because I had rheumatic fever when I was a young boy and it was just, and I was restricted from any activities, no athletics, nothing. I wasn't even allowed to go upstairs, walk upstairs for the oh, first wow. two years after Mariana to avoid what in those days they thought was, you know, would have caused heart disease. Anyway, so I was over 200 pounds and didn't blink an eye. Um, because in those days as a longshoreman, um, you had a little hook, right? And you had mm-hmm. to carry stuff out of ships. Well, I, I shared that story already. So, so when I look back at my father, my father was a role model for many things. Hardworking, um, generous to a fault. My father would not buy something for himself to give to my sister, myself, to my mother, or even to friends and even strangers. Um, he was always grateful for everything he had. He was in his own form religious. He was not a Sunday churchgoer, at least not towards the latter part of his life, and yet he prayed every day. So he taught me all that. He taught me about the importance of family. He taught me about honor. He taught me about being a man of my word, since he was a man. Listen, my father, if he said something, that was it. But you knew what he said he was going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Uh. So, but was he like overly emotional and and affectionate? No, no. My father was not warm and cuddly. Yeah. Interesting thing is that when my sister had children, then he became warm and cuddly. It was funny. When he became a grandfather, he was all about it. Hugs, (laughs) kisses, this, that, ice cream here, there, and everywhere. And I'm looking to say, is this the same guy that Rodney is? This my father? (laughs) But it also goes to show, I think, for all of us, there's a time and a season for everything in your life, right? And I think my father in his younger years was so attuned to being the provider and the defender of the family that that was his prime duty. And as he grew older, it shifted, right? Because we were set up, my sister and I were grown. So there was another side of his personality. So my father was a complicated man. But he was a genuinely good man. And um, I I often reflect on this. I had my share of problems with my father growing up because at times he was too severe. At times he was too tough. He was too stubborn. He was too unyielding by my estimate. Mm -hmm. But as I've grown old, I look back and I realize that, well, first of all, I realized two things. Number one, is that I was only seeing the story from one side, which was mine. And you get a better perspective as you grow older, right, for all of us. And the second is, especially as a diocesan bishop, I, I have come to realize there is more in my father and me than I realized when I was a young man. Because I always fancied myself as carrying most of my mother's traits, which are true. My mm-hmm. mother was tremendously formative. But there's a lot of my father in me that's coming out as I grow older that I would never have admitted maybe 20 years ago. Interesting, right? Yeah. A- any one in particular that you'd like to share right now? or uh, I- I'm going to use this term because I'm not sure what uh, the, the polite term um, the more is perseverance mm-hmm. to stay true to what you need to do. I kind of, in my poetic moments, call it a fierceness of spirit. We could call it zeal Mm -hmm. in religious terms. My father, for the things my father believed in, my father would have died for them, without a doubt. He would have fought anyone. He could care less who you were. You could be the president of the United States or a homeless man. For him, you were all equal. And, And as I've grown older and I've had to make some really tough decisions... I could hear my father in the background whispering to me, he says, if you believe this is the right thing to do, then you need to stand firm for what you believe. Mm -hmm. And so please God, never in a stubborn spirit, never in a, in a, I've already decided, so I'm play acting. But once everything has been out there, you make a decision, you have to stand firm with that if, if you believe it's the right thing to do. My father lived that completely all the time. Yeah. So that's coming out in me. And of course, now in this time when we have to make some really tough decisions, please God, everyone will be listened to. But once the decision is made, we've got to keep moving on, right? Yeah. Yeah. And 
uh, I'm sure you're in in your position. You feel like this. I say it um, all the time to my kids, and it's. I think it's probably the kind of thing that your dad would say to you. But you know, I always tell my kids, you know, I'm your buddy, I'm your friend, but I'm your father first. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. And you cannot be. But my father was never my friend. Never, never <sighs> imagined it. Never wanted to be. As I've said many times, my father, in a lot of my homilies, my father, the single one word that animated my father's life was respect. Mm -hmm. It was not love. It was respect. For my father, an act of respect was an act of love. I am your father, which means I I am here to guide you, protect you, educate you, feed you, and allow you a start in life. That's how, that's how I love you. You see, anybody can say, I love you. What does that mean? Yeah. I'm going to do it. And my father really sacrificed, really sacrificed. I mean, when I went to Yale in 1977, because my father worked so hard as a longshoreman and worked lots of overtime, I got no financial aid to go to Yale, hmm. which meant my father agreed to pay $7,700 a semester at Yale. And my father said to me, I will never allow you to take out a student loan Hmm. because you are my responsibility. So my father was going to pay $15,000 a year in 1977 for my education at Yale, which I look back is astonishing. Yeah. And even if it meant he was going to eat minestrone six days a week, he would have. So I look back and I look at my life and many people call me father. I don't have biological children. Many call me father and I reflect on that on Father's Day. You know, that's a title that I have to earn, right? Anybody does. And so am I willing to be that self-sacrificial? It's something that's, you know, I've always examined my conscience about. You know, one other thing too, if I may, about my father. There are certain traits in my father that I don't want to emulate. It may be that's true for all of us, true for mother and father. My father had a, (laughs) uh, if my sister were on this, I'm sure she would describe this differently, but he had a fiery temper. You cross my father. First of all, you would hear every word in the book (laughs) and every color, shape, and size, right? And he didn't mince words. And the funny thing is, he would explode. And then, Steve, like three minutes later, you're you're standing there. And he, as if nothing happened, it was like, okay, let's go on with life. I said what I said, you said what you said, and let's move on. And it, it took me a while growing up to realize that that wasn't play acting. That was how my father was. He had... Those 30 seconds where he would just let loose and then maybe two minutes later regroup and never apologize, but never hold a grudge Mm -hmm. and just move on. Hmm. Now, that trait I do not have. And sometimes what's the lesson? I think for those of us who are fathers in any capacity, we want to give good modeling and good example. But we also realize that our bad example also is instructive. Right. And we should be honest enough to tell our children, our godchildren, our grandchildren, our spiritual children, you know what? If you see this in me, learn by a negative example. Do not follow this in your life, right? right? I'm working on it, but don't imitate it, right? Yeah. Because none of us are perfect. Right. True. You started to talk about, um, you know, to be a father, uh, whatever your state in life is, but as a father, it really starts with being um, a man of God, a caretaker of souls, um, reflecting the love of, of God, our Father, in our lives. Can you kind of talk more about that, Excellency? Sure, sure. I think one of the most provocative and intuitive portions of Revelation in the New Testament is Jesus' designation of the Father, Right? In Hebrew, in its original Aramaic, it's Abba, which we would describe, we would define as daddy, really, in English. So it's not just that he's calling him father in a tone of respect, but it's in profound and intimate intimacy. Yes. When Jesus prayed to the father, all right, he called him daddy, Abba. 
Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, first of all, it's, it, it's an intuition into the Trinity itself, which is a perfect divine communion of love. Right? We've talked about that already. The Father emptying himself completely to his Son, his Son completely to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the living person of their love. Right? So self-emptying. So, so to be a father, as is true for a mother, it's self-emptying. It's giving your life over so that this child may have the fullness of life. And the reciprocal is true. A child is to give their life over, first to their parents and then to others whom they meet, because that's the essence of what life is, self-gift. So Jesus is, by his very word, teaching us a tremendous spiritual lesson. So let me ask you this. Those who are listening, do you intellectually, affectively, and deeply spiritually understand your relationship with God as a daddy, as someone you could run to and run into his arms and to cry and to bring your hopes and dreams and struggles, not always asking for something? but just simply to seek reassurance of love and purpose, to be able to know that even if you've fallen flat on your face, he is not going to turn his back to you, even though he will ask you and demand of you better change. I mean, for those who have that relationship with God, they are on the road to sainthood. That's what sanctity is, to intuit God's presence and his will and to surrender to it completely. Right? Um, you know how offensive that designation would have been to Jesus' contemporaries? Consider for a moment, faithful, orthodox, Jewish sisters and brothers of ours, to this day, will never utter the name of God. Hmm. For they have a deep sense of humility and unworthiness. Who are they to utter God's name, particularly when uttering someone's name is to make a claim on that person? So a parent names a child for a reason. Right. You're not like number one, number two, number <laughs> three. You, 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 you name the... Because there's a claim made. Right. Right? So... So uh, the faithful among the, uh, our Jewish sisters and brothers would never name God. Never. Never. Jesus just doesn't name him and calls him daddy. Yeah. I mean, that must have come across as just an outrageous, almost religiously insane claim to make. But he did. And he's enshrined it in the Our Father, the paradigmatic prayer for all Christians. Mm. Right? It's the one prayer all Christians share. Still, even after all of our divisions, through the, as sad as they are, through the centuries, it's the one prayer we all still utter together. Yeah. And in it, we, we call God, in the intention of Jesus, Daddy. And what do we do? We honor him. Hallowed be thy name. What do we do on Father's Day? We honor our fathers. All right, so who's honoring God the Father on Father's Day? Yeah. Right? Right. We, yeah, we should be. Intentionally, yes. this day above all others, to say to him, hallowed be thy name. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. And may I just say one other thing, too, since I'm, on, I'm, 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 I'm rolling here on my soapbox. One last yeah. thing, if I may, <laughs> to anticipate maybe what you're going to ask. And if you're not, let me, let me throw the question out. <laughs> okay. It, it's the vocation of fathers and mothers that are the most important in our church. And they're the hardest to live. Yeah. To be a good father and a good mother, particularly in this case, we're talking about fathers, to be a good father is really difficult in the modern world, isn't it? Yeah. I actually feel like a failure every day. <laughs> well, no, well, that's because you're too hard on yourself, Steve. But I mean, but it's hard because young men as they grow in our society, have so many temptations 
to, to live inauthentic lives. True. And, yes. Right? And starting with the scourge of pornography. Yeah. Which is rampant among young people, particularly young men. Yeah. That, that renders them in a position where they remain emotionally immature, where they look upon women as an object of desire, which is terrible. Right. And stunts their ability to really enter into meaningful relationships with women and others for that matter, for anybody. Yeah. And when you become a father, then it's all about relationships, isn't it? Right. First with your wife, which is fundamental, then yes. with your children. Yes. Right? So uh, it, to be a father is tough, and we have to do a better job of engaging men in our church, I think. Yeah. Specifically in this vocation to become a father. Yeah. And thankfully, over the past few years, there have been a lot of different Catholic groups, Christian groups that have really tried to address men as fathers. Um, have you ever heard a story that Scott Hahn tells about um, a man and his son Armand in Armenia? Uh, no, tell oh, me. No. Okay, so heard. really quickly. I, uh, so it's Armenia um, on December 7th, 1988, and a man's driving his son Armand to school, and he drops him off at school, and he says... Before he leaves, he says, I love you, Armand. No matter what, I'll always be there for you. And he goes off to work. And later that morning, a 6.9 magnitude earthquake hits the country and just devastates it. So the man wow. rushes in his car and races back to the school. And when he arrives at Armand's school, he sees that the whole school has just been reduced to a pile of rubble. He remembered that Armand's classroom was over in the... Um, I think it was the east wing of the school. So he runs over there and he just starts digging in the dirt and in the rubble. And other parents start arriving. They see him and they start digging too. Five hours they're in there with their hands and knees digging. And then 10 hours. Some people get exhausted. They start giving up. They stop digging. This man keeps going. 20 hours. His fingers, his hands are bloody. His body and his clothes are all covered with dirt. 30 hours, people standing on the side start telling the man, forget it, they're all dead, stop digging. But he keeps going. 38 hours, 38 hours later, suddenly they hear some children's voices under the rubble. And so people on the sidelines jump up and they start helping again. And the man ends up pushing one boulder to the side and there they were, Armand and his 14 classmates. And the man says, Armand! And the boy says, Papa. And then Armand turns to his classmates and he says, you see, I told you he was coming for me. Mm -hmm. And Scott Hahn says, that tells that story because he says, that's the kind of faith we should have because that's the kind of father we have in heaven. In heaven, right. The father is the, is the co-giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. He is the defender of life. Any human father, that describes what you are, a co-creator of life with, with your wife and God the Father, the sustainer of life, the defender of life. And what does God the Father do for us? He gives us life. He sustains us in his grace. He defends us, as you describe, and he wants to bring us home. Yes. What else do you need? What else do you want? What else do we need in the end? Right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, Excellency, this is a, a great segment. We could talk for hours about this, but we mm -hmm. need to take a break, and then we have, uh, we'll talk about vocations when we come back. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Catholic Radio works, and now we have it here in Connecticut and New York. It's been seen around the country that there's no better tool for evangelization. Where there's Catholic Radio, the folks who listen deepen their faith, Families are strengthened, parishes and communities flourish. So, let people know you're listening to Veritas, tell your friends to tune in, and let's make an impact here for Jesus and His Church. This is Steve Lee for Veritas Catholic Network. Okay, welcome back. This is Let Me Be Frank featuring Bishop Frank Caggiano. Excellency, great discussion on fatherhood. Uh, now mm -hmm. we're going to talk about um, vocations. So, mm -hmm. 
let's start at the beginning as we usually do and tell us what is a vocation? Okay, so it's from the Latin word vocare, to call, to be called. And as I've done in many times when I've given talks about vocations, I tell young men and young women, um, those men discerning priesthood or diaconate, women discerning religious or consecrated life, I tell them that you don't decide to become a sister or a brother. You discern Mm -hmm. whether God is asking you to be a sister. Because if you decide on your own, chances are you would be very miserable. It's no different than for those who marry. You don't just decide to marry someone. You discern it because you encounter someone, right? Yes. That you didn't plan 10 years before right. that just strikes you like a lightning bolt. And you say, is, this, is the, this is it. This is the person. This is the yeah. woman I'm going to marry. This is it. So, so what's the, the fundamental principle here? The fundamental principle here is that for every human life, every human person, God has a plan, a plan for a joyful earthly life, not a happy life, a joyful life in this world and a life of eternal fulfillment and glory in the life to come. And that plan to discern it and then have the courage to do it is Christian discipleship. In fact, it's the root of holiness, right? So in a world of noise, distraction, entertainment, self-gratification, and I could go on and on and on, we have set up a network, a nexus, a matrix in society where discerning is becoming more and more difficult for anyone. But for those who can, um, they will discover their vocation. Hmm. So the community has a large role to play, starting with family. I've told you my story about my vocation. My father was deathly opposed. Deathly. He wanted to be and mayor of New York. everything I just described to my father, he was formidable. My father was formidable. Yeah. Quite formidable in this regard. And my mother, if my mother had died that day when I told her I wanted to be a priest, she would have died happy. She was, she was, she was done. Right? She was all in. Um, so... So it starts in the family, it's your friends, and then larger society, right? So again, to discern vocation now for young people, families cannot listen well to the spirit. Larger extended families, society, it's tough. It really is tough going. So um, vocations can be to priesthood, to diaconate, to consecrated life, to a lay state in an institute of apostolic life, right? That one can be called to live that, uh, to married life. It's interesting about single life. There's a big, a, a big theological debate whether single life is itself a state of life. Um, and the reason the debate, not to get too esoteric, is because it's not a term, it, is it a terminus? So married life, you're married for life, you become a priest for life. Can someone choose to be single for life? Really, and the general consensus now is yes. Yes, you can. A person can make that choice. Mm -hmm. In which case, there's more and more of a consensus that even single life can be considered in that sense of vocation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even Pope Francis at the Synod on Young People made that shift. It broadened the notion of vocation beyond just priesthood, diaconate, and religious life. So in that sense, everybody has a vocation. Everyone's being called to some state of life, so to some way of living discipleship. So um, how, how, do we, how do we discern where we're called to be? Uh, uh, oh, many ways. Uh, first, uh, in prayer, essential to listen. It's reflecting back what people are saying to you. I'll never forget Sister Rebecca telling me, you know, that you're going to be a priest. I told you the story of Bishop McGovero stopping in the confirmation. He said, yes. one day I'm going to ordain you, right? I told that yes. story. I mean, all these things reflect back on me and it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa. Uh, Mrs. Goldstein said to me, she prayed to live long enough to come to my ordination as a priest. I was in seventh grade. I said, wow. what is this woman talking about? Wow. Uh, so 
that's part of the discernment, right? People see qualities in you. And many times in our politically correct society, we don't say anything to young people, but we should. You know, I think you would be a great husband and father. Why don't we say that? I think I see qualities that you would be a fantastic priest or a sister or a brother. We yes. should because that's the spirit helping this person to discern. Yeah. And then, of course, for the vocations that are the permanent states of religious life or, or ordained life, then the community accompanies you, right, in formation right. through faculties and seminaries and directors to be able to say, you know what, um, you may... Th you think you have discerned this vocation, but the community does not agree. We do not see it. Right. Because you're serving the mystical body of Christ. It's not just a personal possession. So lots of ways of doing that. But let me ask you this, Steve. How many, how many people listening to us today who have young children ever talk to them about the possibility of being a religious sister? Right. Or a religious brother or a priest? or a missionary, my sense is a lot do not. Yeah. In a former age, they did. And I'll tell you, the only time I remember my father becoming emotional in his earlier years was when he spoke about his brother Antonio who died in the seminary. Even when my grandmother died, my father did not cry. Grandfather died, he did not cry. But he was welling up when he spoke about his brother dying in the seminary at a young age. It's interesting, huh? There was yeah. something yeah. in in his a religious imagination that touched him deeply. As much as he kept a very, you know, tough exterior, it touched him. Yeah. Right? And he spoke about it. Now, he didn't want his son to be a priest, but he wanted everybody else's son to be a priest. But that's not the point. The point is, it touched him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're we're very intentional about having um, priests over to the house, having men in collars around our kids a lot, going to the Sisters of Life and volunteering there so our daughter can see the sisters. Um, and just put it there. Yes. As part of the material that the Holy Spirit's going to use to help them to discern what it is God wants of them. Yeah. Right? Right. So there's there's a large element of... Um, being silent, listening for God's call. And mm -hmm. like you said, he'll call you in many different ways and po possibly at many different moments through mm -hmm. different people in your life as well. Do you recommend also that, um, you know, all young men should do, say, like a, a test your call retreat in a seminary or all young women should try life for a short time as a postulant? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be a liar if I said, testing should not be encouraged as part of a discernment because I've told the story already about how I fought against my vocation for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And in part because of that stubbornness in my, that I kind of inherited from my father, which I'm not willing to admit now that I'm 61 years old. <laughs> and um, uh, that's not a bad thing because we need people to discern and accept their divinely given vocation with both feet in. Mm -hmm. Whether it is religious life or clerical life or married life, we need a real commitment. And if there's a part of one's heart that is torn, oftentimes it's torn. When I look back on my life, it was torn because I firmly believed that the grass was always greener on the other side. So I, I fell for that big time that money and authority and travel and the good life was, you know, was, was what life was all about. Yeah. And, you know, being a slow learner, I had to learn the hard way that that was not the case. It's not the case. And others may have other, you know, other issues that they have to struggle with and try to come to terms with, particularly in the life of celibacy that a priest will need to embrace. It took me a long time to realize that a true celibate gains far more than you sacrifice and give up. Is there a sacrifice? Without a doubt. Is it only a sacrificial life? Absolutely not. 
And if you jump both feet in, there were some beautiful experiences in my life that are priceless. Because to a priest, for example, they will open up a part of their heart they may not open up to anyone else. Hmm. You know, you're standing on holy ground. It is such a privilege to be able to do that and enter into that intimate relationship. So people call me father. Now I understand what that means in those moments. Just as much as I think perhaps your children will open up to you, to your wife about things, they wouldn't tell anyone else. Yeah. And there may be things they'll tell their spiritual father they may not even tell you. Yeah, right. But I hope that's so, an actually. Intimate relation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there's, so there's that. Um, so I think in this context, we have a shortage of priests and deacons. We have a shortage of religious. The fundamental point is, is God not calling young people and people of other ages? Absolutely not. He has never stopped calling. It's just more and more difficult to discern it and to hear it. That's yeah. the issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. after, after I had been dating... Um, Rula, who is now my wife, for a um, couple years, two years, two and a half years or so, and we were starting to talk about marriage, I went and I said, before we continue, I went and I did um, two weeks uh, in a, the seminary of a, of a order of priests that I had uh, worked a lot with over the years. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm -hmm. I just got to... You know, I, I love you. I think this is right, but I just got to make sure. And she was pretty amazing. She was like, okay, makes sense. Hope you come back. <laughs> um, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> and you did, thank I God. I did, yeah. I had a, I remember one, you mentioned celibacy. And I remember um, there was one priest when I was younger. And I said, I said, so father, so you you can't you're you're celibate, and Father looked at me and said, "Do you do you plan on getting married?" And I said, "Yes." He said, "I only gave up one more girl than you did." <laughs> and I was like, "Well, okay." <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And I must tell you, I I um, I wonder to myself every once in a while. I said to myself, if I had chosen to marry. What type of father would I have been? What type of husband would I have been? I please God, I would have been a good one. Hmm. And then I realized, well, you know what? If the answer to that question is, I would not have been a good one, then I'm going to be a lousy priest too. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> sure. Because either way, you need to reflect mm -hmm. God. Right, it's the same yeah. qualities, isn't it? In, in it? It's self-gift, it's self-sacrifice, it's nurturing, it's loving, it's educative, it's protective, it's the defender, it's... Yeah, you know, it's 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 the same qualities. I um, I've been very blessed because my family has always been very close to me, and I to my family. This is my natural family. Yes. So my niece and nephew growing up are kind of like children. Yeah. My niece's children are kind of like my grandchildren. It's the same uh, interesting dynamic, even though there's it, it's so. God has been very good to me. Yeah. God has been very good to me. In my heart. I don't deserve it. I'll gladly take it. He has been very good to me. I don't ever, I've never regretted what I ultimately said yes to. Never. And I do it again a thousand times. With all the craziness we have lived through in the church and the great sorrows, right? The challenges. I would do it again yeah. without thinking twice. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so, to, so to kind of summarize this, for young people, mm -hmm. pray. Ask God where he's leading you and be quiet so you can hear it. Pick up the clues yeah. and the signs. Wow, that's the key. Because most people will say, young people will say, okay, I'm praying, I don't hear anything. Hmm. Well, if you're expecting God to send you a telegram or tell you in words, you may hold your breath for a while. <laughs> but, right? but God does speak in signs and in symbols and in action, and in events. Now that's where the discernment comes in. Mm. So, an old lady turns to you and says, uh, an older lady turns to you and says, I think I, you would be a great priest. Let's unpack that. 
So spiritual direction, spiritual guides are crucial for all of us, but particularly young people. So if that happened and I was sitting in front of a young person, a young man, I would say, okay, so now let's freeze that picture. What was going on? How does she know you? What did she see? And let's reflect on those qualities. What did they tell you about you? Yes. Because the one thing I've said many times, I'll say it again, I'll say it again till the day I die. Priesthood, the accident, religious life are not defaults for those who for whatever reason are not marrying. It's not meant to be that. Certainly never meant to be that. Right. right? Yes. It's not meant to be that. So there's a free choice once to discern. So if God is asking you to do this, you could say no. Yeah. And just as you beautifully described in that the, that story, beautiful story in Armenia, it, the father's not going to turn his back. He's still going to go. He's still going to accompany you. Yeah. But it's not the road that would be perhaps the easiest road to follow, as God would God sees the whole picture. But He's not going to abandon you in any road you choose. Yeah. 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 You know, there's. Um... Uh, with this religious order that I used to work with a lot, the uh, vocations director, I was there at a talk that he gave to a group of men once, and it was a vocations talk. And at the end of the talk, a man came up and said, Father, I'm ready. I'm ready to enter the seminary. And um, I prayed about it, and um, I'm good to go. And Father said, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And the man said, yeah, and you know, my wife is on board, and she's, she's all for it too. <laughs> Father said, hold on a second. You have your vocation. <laughs> wow, that was yeah. some talk then. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of um, Father Walter Chiswick is a, Je a Jesuit priest, uh, wrote a book called He Leadeth Me about his time in a Siberian prison camp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things that really sticks out to me from that book is he wrote that God's will is really what he sends us every day. It's not necessarily the big, you know, explosions in life. It's the, the circumstances, places, people, problems in here and now that he sends to us in every moment. And that's what constitutes the will of God. And that's what we need to follow and accept. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's funny you should say that. Uh, Waze has become like my best friend in the car now. Uh -huh. We're traveling around. <laughs> Okay, especially when it recalculates. Now, of course, now during the pandemic, when I've been traveling around, the traffic is, is, is very light. But when we go back to whatever normal is, it's, it's ingenious to keep you to the proper destination, but meander, right, the directions in the immediate. Yes. But that's exactly what you're describing, right? Huh. right? Yeah. So God's will is for us to enter into his life in heaven as St. Thomas says, to perpetually fall ever more deeply in love with God. But to get there, there will be twists and turns along the way, and God will help us to adjust with his grace how to get there. And that's kind of like what you're describing, right? Yeah. And both are aspects of God's will. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need right. to be quiet and listen. So then this is the real, one of the great challenges in life. You know, you'll have people get up one morning and say, uh, this is not working. This is the wrong vocation. This is not for me. This is it. And in our world, it's attuned to, okay, then walk out and try something else. Right. And we as Christian, as a Christian community need to help those individuals before they make decisions to discern whether or not that which they're feeling has a different route, has yeah. a different solution, a different path. Yeah. Because our vocations and our promises are meant to endure for a lifetime. So there could be very difficult circumstances a person finds, right? Yes. But, but my sense is discernment is not just to get into the vocation. Discernment accompanies the vocation your whole life. Yeah. Because you're going to have challenges in life. The, the, you know, it, no life is without problems, right? Yep. So discernment is part of every Christian's life for his, his or her whole life. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a message the world doesn't want to hear today. No, I mean, no, because the, in the end, not to become too much of a social critic, but our, everything in our structure, societally, is for immediate either impact or gratification. Because that's what a materialistic and secular society ultimately believes. Materialistic is that everything around me is something I can buy and sell and is meant for my satisfaction. And secularism, because everything rises and falls on me. Mm -hmm. It's just me. Mm -hmm. right? Now, both of those are lies in the end. So when you build a society on those false premises, you have a lot of dysfunction. Yeah. And that's ultimately what we're caught in. And, and even the best of us, whoever's listening, has to struggle with that because um, it's all around us in subtle ways, in very subtle ways. And we've talked about social media. We've talked about the electronic venues that we use now, the digital continent. It's just, it's very easy to fall into this, it's all about me, and it's all about objectifying reality because, in the end, it's my gratification, like right now. Yeah. One of the lessons my father always taught me is, I don't care what you want right now. I'm yes. not interested. What my father always told me is, what What do you want in ten years from now? And what you want 10 years ago will, will determine your choices right now. So you want to be, like we've talked, I've joked about wanting to be a politician, being the mayor, being, whatever it was. My father said, it, so in 10 years, that's what you wanted. Tell me what you have to do right now to get there. Yeah. I don't care what you want to do right now. Yeah. It's an interesting perspective, a lesson, a life lesson he taught me I've always used yeah. in my life. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Right. Let's take uh, one more break, Excellency, and come back and answer some listener questions. Great. We need Catholic Radio because we need the voice of the church in the public forum. We live in a time that the secular voice dominates so thoroughly that we need to get that Catholic perspective out. Just as Fulton Sheen used radio and TV in the last century, we need to continue to use. This means to announce the Catholic faith in the public forum. All right. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Um, Excellency, we got a uh, couple questions here, and uh, I think the first one is strikingly relevant to our conversation today. Mm -hmm. It com comes in from Sarah in Ridgefield. She wants to know, how do we fulfill the call to be missionary disciples within the context of our vocation as mother and father? Tremendous question. Tremendous. It's at the heart of the renewal we want for the church. Because the bedrock of the church is the family. And if the family is in crisis, we should not be surprised that the church is facing ever greater challenges. Right? So we have this image that mission is literally to go out of our homes or out of our churches to go into the world to proclaim the gospel to evangelists. And that is all true. But like every other situation, even in battle, you don't totally empty your barricade or your barracks to go out because you leave yourself undefended. Right. So it is both going out and turning attention within. So what's the family? The church calls it the domestic church. So a father and mother in that family are the, for lack of a better word, the religious leaders of that church. And missionary discipleship starts with that primary vocation. So, you know, I am a professional catechist as a, as a trained religious, right, as a cleric. But catechesis is built on evangelization. So the primary role of a missionary disciple who is a father and mother is to teach their children by word and example that God is real. And you do that by the love you share with your children since God is love. 
In other words, missionary discipleship in parents is all about making God's love real in the formative years of a child's life, from infancy to, to young childhood. The first seven years of one's life forms one absolutely fundamentally in some of the affective traits that lead them for the rest of their lives. So I would suggest, Sarah, that the real question here is, if you're speaking about mothers and fathers, to be a missionary disciple, to be a good one, is to be a good parent. You don't have to leave your four walls or the confines to do that. And to be a good parent is to love, in the true sense of the word, to accompany, in the true sense of the word, and to help a child to pray, because your love is to lead them to the love of God, which is what prayer does. If you do that, you will be a spectacular missionary disciple. Great. Uh, we have uh, our second question, Excellency, comes from Margaret in Darien. Mm -hmm. She wants to know, and uh, so this is, uh, her question is obviously relevant to the, uh, the times today. Yes. Uh, yes. So she says, how can the Catholic Church lead in healing our communities and recovering from the crises? Well, that's, that, is a, that is a question perhaps, Steve, we should take a whole show and talk about. Yeah, it's, okay. It's so important. It's so profound. Um, you know, I've begun to think this through because we have heard lots of tributes, lots of words, but you know, words in the end fade away. It's really a time for prudent and discerning action mm -hmm. to bring healing. Now, only the true healing of life comes from Jesus Christ to be the conduits of his grace. Because all of this inequality, bigotry, discrimination, it's all sin in the end. It's sin. It's personal sin. It's societal sin, collective sin. So we need repentance and conversion, right, of individual hearts, and then society will change. If we think we're not going, if we're going to make real change without conversion of lives, it's not going to live long. It won't last. Yeah. But, but even having said that, um, what actions do we really need? I, I would just suggest this. As a first step, I think we need to listen. Y your heart converts when it becomes empathetic, when it becomes sympathetic, when it becomes compassionate to suffer with someone. So maybe the very first step is that we need to allow people to tell their stories of their real suffering and real pain and real discrimination. I told the one about my mom, remember a long time ago when we first started our podcast? Yes. That moves my heart because that was my mother who was standing there. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we listen to people's stories and give them the forum to witness to their suffering and pain? And you know what? If as they articulate that, they will also come forward with, with their, what their heart tells them is part of the solution. What needs to change? What actions need to be done? And perhaps that starts the dialogue that will allow healing because our conviction to change and the grace of the Holy Spirit can actually make meaningful change. And the meaningful change is what the healing is all about, right? Yeah. That would, uh, I'm thinking, well, I've already started the conversation internally in the diocese to facilitate a lot of this in our own diocese to see perhaps we can become agents of real healing. So maybe at a future show we could talk a little bit more about that as more of that planning becomes yeah. concretized. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. We, uh, we love hearing from all our listeners. So uh, if you have a question for the bishop, send them in to questions at veritascatholic.com. You know, Excellency, the other you mentioned uh, earlier also that I would love to talk more about in a, a future episode, but you were talking about um, a joyful life versus a happy life. Oh, so, absolutely. Love to hear it's you. One of the, oh, let's do that. That's, that is one of the fundamental challenges of, of modern American life. We are promised to be happy. And that's a promise that I'm not sure anybody can really make. Yeah. Yeah. 
But we, you, you should teach all of us on that episode about the difference between joy oh, and yeah. happiness. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, thanks again to the Knights of Columbus Museum for sponsoring this program. The Knights of Columbus Museum has been helping, let me be frank, bring solid Catholic content to you each week. So please check out kofcmuseum.org for more good content for your family. You can always find Bishop Frank Caggiano on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Veritas is there too. Excellency, may I please ask uh, for you to give us your blessing? Absolutely. And if I can, may we um, uh, lift up our fathers, grandfathers, living and deceased too in a special way as we anticipate, especially you, my friend. Yeah. Thanks. (laughs) In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Merciful and compassionate Father, we come to you. We honor and praise you. We worship you and thank you as our Father in heaven. But as we prepare to celebrate Father's Day, we lift up to you our fathers, our natural fathers, our fathers in spirit. Please guide and protect them. Grant them strength to fulfill the vocation you have given them. For those who have died, grant them eternal rest and peace and help us to strengthen one another on this journey to the everlasting life you promise us. For we make our prayer as we ask all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Steve, happy Father's Day to you, my friend. Happy Father's Day to you, Bishop Frank. Thanks for another great show. Thank you.